Hello. Um, my name is Mariana Panuncio Feldman, and I am uh, the Senior Director for International Climate Cooperation at World Wildlife Fund's U.S. office. Welcome to our panel, uh, Realizing Global Ambition Locally, How Domestic Multi-Stakeholder Alliances Can Drive Greater Climate Action and Ambition Around the World. Um, thank you to the Climate Vulnerable Forum for hosting this virtual global carbon-free summit. I am thrilled um, to be included among um, heads of state ministers and leaders from around the planet in discussing how we can accelerate climate action between now and 2020 in order to safeguard humanity and our planet. I look forward to the panel conversation we're going to have today um, with our panelists sharing stories of how do the national coalitions of subnational and non-state actors they represent are working to enhance action and national ambition in their countries. The Paris Agreement gave the world hope, hope that humanity can effectively address the global climate challenge, um, and it gave us a sense of direction, a clear sense of direction of how we can address uh, the crisis at hand. The IPCC report further reinforced the message uh, with an urgent call to all countries to step up climate ambition, accelerate action, and mobilize support in solidarity with the most vulnerable around the world. Now, while the message, the direction is clear, the science is clear, the big question is how can we get there as fast and as comprehensively as we need to? We need political will, will from national governments that provide a unified commitment to build prosperity and well-being through low carbon and climate resilient development. But we also need all of the actors in the real economy engaged. We need companies, cities, states, academia, civil society, everyone around the world engaging at the national level to show through their actions that we can accelerate this transformation. Through this summit, the Climate Vulnerable Forum seeks to galvanize an alliance of front runners to champion climate action, greater ambition, and solidarity. This panel is about the front runners coming together at the national level to play their part. Alliances for Climate Action is a global network of domestic multi-stakeholder coalitions that are committed to supporting the delivery and the enhancement of their country's climate commitments. Alliances for Climate Action connects cities, states, private sector, investors, universities, and civil society at the national level so they can work with each other and with their national governments to drive climate action. What you're going to hear today are from the coalitions that have come to life in the last year and a half. We have had a coalition, coalitions formed in the United States, Japan, Mexico, and as of yesterday in Argentina. They are known as We Are Still In, the Japan Climate Initiative, Alianza para la Acción Climática de Guadalajara, and Alianza para la Acción Climática Argentina. Um, this effort, Alliances for Climate Action, is being championed by C40, CDP, Fundación Avina, the Climate Group, Women Business, and WWF, together with leading partners at the national level. So today, we're joined by representatives from each of these coalitions who are personally engaged in the work of these coalitions and in driving climate action in their own institutions and their countries. The people we have around this virtual table are Alexa Kluster, the Deputy Secretary for Border and Intergovernmental Relations of the um, California Environmental Protection Agency, representing We Are Still In. We have Mr. Sergio Cato, the Corporate Vice President of RICO, representing the Japan Climate Initiative. We have Cecilia Perales de Dios, Climate Change Unit Coordinator at the Ministry of the Environment and Territorial Development of the State of Jalisco, representing the Mexican Alianza para la Acción Climática de Guadalajara. And finally, we have Kristen Felkam, Executive Director of the Regional Consortium for Agriculture Experimentation, CREA, um, representing Alianza para la Acción Climática de Argentina. So before we jump into our conversation, I would like to remind viewers um, that the official summit hashtag is virtual su climate summit, virtual climate summit, and the panel summit hashtag is CVF summit panel. Please use this hashtag in our, um, for, um, uh, so that you can join our discussion by posing, posting questions and comments on Twitter, uh, which we will address at the end of our session. And again, if you have any questions, post on Twitter using CVF 
Summit panel. So with that, welcome everybody, and um, we would like to get started. So let's start with you, um, Alexa. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, Alexa, the, the Global Climate Action Summit was such an important moment this year, and the government of California was the engine that brought um, GCAS into being. It compellingly showed that subnational and non-state actors from around the world are committed to climate action, and it closed, the summit closed, with a rallying cry for national governments and subnational and non-state actors around the world to do more, and it's called the GCAS Call to Action. As a core team, as part of the core team that organized GCAS on behalf of the government of California, and as your home state is right now experiencing the deadliest fire, wildfire in its history, Tell us, why was GCAS such an important moment? Why was the GCAS call to action so important? And why did the GCAS call to action specifically call for bottom-up engagement of subnational and non-state actors as a critical piece of the call to action? Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Mariana. Uh, and thank you to the Marshall Islands, uh, to President Heine, and to all the CVF members for hosting this important global summit. Um, it's my first truly remote international summit. Um, so I'm very happy to be here and thankful uh, for the organizers. This is a, a great moment. Um, and to your question, I think I'll just take a step back on the Global Climate Action Summit. Um, we are very happy as, as California with the results. So we were so thankful to the, to the world for coming to join us in California. Um, we had over 5,000 participants from six continents and 103 countries. Um, we had over 325 affiliate, affiliate events and over 500 new commitments put on the table uh, throughout the, the week-long activities of the summit. Um, I think the, the, the summit overall was, was important uh, really to highlight three things, that subnational actors already are, are doing a lot uh, to implement existing ambitious targets. Um, so these actions are and, and policies are already taking place on the ground and they're working to, to meet these goals that we've set. Uh, secondly, um, that some national actors are committing to do more and to step up their, their targets and goals from here to 2020, which we know is such an important year as the national governments should be coming back to the table to, to put new and enhanced ambition um, on, on, the, on the international stage through their nationally determined contributions. Um, and thirdly, uh, related to that is to, to really set the expectation that national governments will come back to the table, um, that they will do more and they will step up at the international level. Um, I think we've seen this, you know, we've seen the pressure even more important after the IPCC report um, recently launched uh, to tell us that we're not doing enough and we need to go further faster. We have 12 more years really to, to save humanity. Um, and so we all need to, to get into gear. So hopefully, you know, our expectations were that, were that the summit helped move everyone in that direction. Um, the call to action that you mentioned is our, was our main political output. So uh, coming from the governor and, and the other co-chairs as a message directly to national governments that they need to also do three, three things. They need to step up their ambition through updated, enhanced, nationally determined contributions by 2020, consistent with what science tells us that we need to reach the Paris goals. Secondly, they need to chart a clear path uh, to their carbon, uh, to their zero carbon future. Um, we know that carbon neutrality is such a key piece if we are to meet our, our, our uh, goals are greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Um, and so we'd like to see those mid-century strategies really come come forward um, as soon as possible and, and with strong science behind them. Um, and then thirdly, to really empower bottom-up climate action. So we'd like national governments uh, to really support and accelerate climate action at the local and regional level um, and, you know, through legislation, regulation, financing, policies that incentivizes this, this movement. Um, and also by, by doing consultations with their subnational actors, whether that's business or cities, states, investors, civil society, to really go back and, and see what's happening on the ground and to reflect that forward and, and fast movement uh, in their next nationally determined contributions. Um, so, you know, 
I think why why is it critical? Um, I think on on one side we're accelerating the current implementation of NDCs. Um, so we are the we are the laboratories of some national actors that can show that things are working on the ground, um, and then national governments, you know, will will want to count these reductions in in meeting their targets. So we can really be those in, that engine room for emissions reductions. Um, and we can also provide political coverage when when these national governments will have to come back in two years uh, to go out on a limb and set new ambitious targets. Um, we can also show that that we're doing it and it's possible and, and these emissions reductions are happening faster than, than uh, expected. And that gives them some political room to, to, to be ambitious and to come forward by 2020 with these ratcheted up commitments. Um, you know, this is what the, the Paris Agreement is all about, this, this five-year cycle and that ratchet mechanism. So we're hoping that some national actors can play a key part to catalyze that new ambition. Um, and, and of course, lastly, we're here to pressure those national governments. Um, this all ties together by us being able to say through the summit that, that we, we have, we're already doing a lot, we're ready to do more, and we're committing to do more, um, but that we have certain expectations that national governments will come with us and will respond to that and will also do their part uh, to, to do what science requires to, to save the planet. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. Um, uh, so I think Alexa set the stage for us, um, uh, and I think um, the the Global Climate Action Summit was absolutely critical um, to show that appetite um, for um, you know that commitment um, from subnational and non-state actors around the world, and that commitment to greater um, you know climate action. Um, the IPCC report further reinforced the message that the Global Climate Action Summit provided by stating not only. Uh, that we urgent that we need to decarbonize urgently, but it also said explicitly that we will only be able to keep 1.5 within reach if we make the low carbon transition at the scale and speed required. And for that, the IPCC said that the engagement of some national and non-state actors around the world is essential. So, Mr. Kato, as you look at the context in Japan. What is the current state of engagement of some national and non-state actors on climate action in Japan? And in light of that, why did the Japan Climate Initiative launch and what is it trying to do? Okay, uh, thank you, Marianne. And also, uh, I'm very proud to be joining uh, this CDF uh, as a representative of the Japan Climate Initiative that I will explain later. So I'd like to express uh, the status of the Japan uh, as a, uh, here uh, to talk about. So I'm, a, I'm actually by one vice president of the A company, LICO, uh, Office Equipment Manufacturer and ICT Service Provider. We, from 1970s, we have started environmental money, uh, conservation and also the, from 90s, uh, we set step up to the environmental management, uh, which meant environmental conservation and the creation of the economic, uh, economic value uh, compatible. From that onward, we always aim to do the low carbon operations. Thanks to the, this long term commitment and engagement, uh, we have been named as the official sponsor of the COP21 which have adopted the Paris Agreement, as you know well. At COP21 in Paris, I have been very impressed by many C-class executives, such as CEO, CMO, CFO of the global companies, with their commitment and engagement to the climate action toward decarbonization, as for the future business risk minimization, and also for the business opportunity point of view. Recognizing this global turning point toward decarbonization and of the decarbonization outlook, we have declared zero emission by 2050 in line with Paris Agreement. And we have also involved, we also try to involve the other corporate to do this environmental management and the targeting the toward uh, the decarbonization. And for this purpose, we have established Japan Climate Leaders Partnership in 2009, 10 years ago. Thanks to this corporate coalition, 
the members are stepping up the climate actions more than the others. And the local readership on the climate exists, like this Japan Climate Readers Partnership, but it is not insufficient or not uh, influential enough. We are not breaking through with companies acting alone or cities alone. We need to come together to raise attention. So as recognizing the importance of speed and expanse, we thought need to create an organized organize joint voices of our cross sectors, companies, local government, academias, and other non-state actors. The response of this matter is GCI, Japan Climate Initiative. It started on uh, July 6 this year with 105 organizations and now gaining more than 290s uh, advance. This Japan Climate Initiative as a first multi-stakeholder coalition in support of the climate action in Japan. So Japan Climate Initiative will enhance collaboration among members and we'll engage with others to make the decarbonization trend consensus of the Japanese society as a whole. So our aim to advance uh, collaboration in four major ways. Firstly, with government. So Japanese government has set up the advisory council to discuss its long-term strategy under the Paris Agreement. And they plan to present the strategy before G20 held to be held in Osaka, Japan next year. So under the circumstances, Japan Crime Initiative will engage with the relevant ministries and the members so that a long-term strategy should include element to show a clear direction of uh, decarbonization in which Japanese leadership uh, can accelerate the world's effort through enhancement of the Japanese uh, climate actions with focus especially on the renewable energies and the energy efficiency. Secondly, with among members, now almost 300 members, we will share the experiences and the knowledges among members and encourage further to join those international initiatives. Sadly, with Japanese society in general, we would like to champagne the climate actions publicly. This year already we have held Japan Climate Action Summit, just copied GCAS, and uh, we have uh, welcomed more than 700 participants, and uh, we issued a declaration, de uh, de declaration uh, toward uh, decarbonization with more than 150 organizations. And fourthly, not last but not least, with the international uh, <clears throat> community like this, we would like to communicate our activities towards the world in the cooperation with the Alliance for the Climate Actions and other international partners. That is our aim. So uh, please uh, uh, let us work with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kato. Thank you. Um, thank you for relaying the world, uh, the work of the, this growing alliance, the Japan Climate Initiative. Cecilia, I would like to turn to you. Um, so Mr. Kato has shared um, this message that from his experience in Japan, and there is leadership, but there is definitely the need to engage more actors and together to be able to have a, a, a greater voice. Um, so do you see this need in Mexico? What are, what are some of the challenges and the opportunities that you see in the Mexican context? And how is the Mexican Alianza para la Acción Climática de Guadalajara uh, seeking to um, ramp up climate action and collaboration in Mexico? Um, and for our audience, um, uh, just um, uh, please know that Cecilia is going to be um, uh, talking in Spanish and we'll be doing consecutive translations. So um, Cecilia, please, um, please come on in. Okay, thank you, Mariana, and thank you for your help. 
Um, sí, es crucial involucrar a más actores en las acciones climáticas. También tenemos eh, que dejar de sectorizar el tema de cambio climático como un tema principalmente o únicamente de, de medio ambiente, ¿no? Esto tiene que empezar a permear a otros sectores y otras dependencias. En el caso de la Secretaría de Medio Ambiente de Jalisco, la cual es la responsable de la coordinación de la acción climática del Estado, pues esta ha sido muy, para ella ha sido muy valiosa la cooperación con diferentes actores internacionales, con actores nacionales, eh, con otras dependencias del propio Estado, así como con el modelo, el modelo de gobernanza eh, ambiental muy innovador que tiene el Estado, que se le conoce como juntas intermunicipales de medio ambiente, y también tenemos un Instituto Metropolitano de Planeación eh, que se llama Limeplan, quien, es, eh, quien está muy activo en esta alianza de, de ACA que tú justamente eh, planteas. Eh, en el Estado también estamos transversalizando con un enfoque de economía baja en carbono y resiliencia al cambio climático eh, a través de la asignación de un presupuesto transversal para el tema de cambio climático. Esto quiere decir que las secretarías del Estado tienen un presupuesto eh, etiquetado para acciones climáticas. Esto creo que es especialmente importante, ya que el cambio climático pues, es un reto transversal y que por lo tanto requiere de una correcta eh, gobernanza. Aquí es donde AKGDL, esta alianza climática, pues logra hacer una plataforma para alinear eh, exitosamente pues, estrategias para coordinar diferentes actores con el fin pues, de que estas medidas sean realizadas bottom up, ¿no? eh, de abajo hacia arriba. Y no solamente pues, como la manera tradicional que ha sido, que ha sido pues, de arriba eh, hacia abajo. Y bueno, pues acá juega un papel de plataforma neutra que busca pues, detonar acciones inmediatas y concretas eh, que tengan impactos locales sin importar los tiempos administrativos. Esto es muy importante pues, porque logra la continuidad eh, de los compromisos adquiridos por diferentes actores. Eh, me voy a detener aquí para que me puedas ayudar con la, con la traducción. Ok, ok. Uh, gracias, eh, Cecilia. Thank you, Cecilia. So, so basically what Cecilia was relaying is that um, she finds that in the Mexican context, it's absolutely critical to involve more stakeholders as well. And she highlighted the fact that it is critical um, to see climate change not as an environmental issue, but rather as a cross-sectoral issue that affects every single economic sector. Um, the um, She was speaking, so she represents um, the the state of Jalisco and so and, and particularly the Secretary of Environment and she was explaining that the Secretary of Environment of Jalisco, a state in Mexico, is responsible for the coordination of climate change actions in the state. And for that, um, historically, as a, as a, a, sub, a subnational uh, governmental entity, they have found that cooperation has been critical to work at the international level, at the national level, at the state level, and even through um, you know, um, other forms, uh, innovative form of subnational coordinations um, in order to, to foster climate action in the state. Um, they have been doing this through specific measures, but also through cross-cutting measures, such as, for example, assigning, um, you know, assigning a cross-cutting climate budget to every single agency in the state so that basically, as she mentioned before, uh, climate action can be mainstream into the work of different economic sectors in the state. But having said that, um, She, um, she, what she explained is that um, it's been um, uh, critical, um, you know, to, to ramp up these efforts, um, um, you know, beyond what they've been doing until now. And this is where um, the concept of this multi-stakeholder alliance, which is the Alianza para la Acción Climática de Guadalajara, has become critical because they see it as the state of Jalisco as a critical platform um, that will, um, what they hope is that will allow for an effective coordination among different different actors in order to align their strategies from the bottom up and not just in an imposed way from the top down. Um, they conceive um, this uh, multi-stakeholder alliance as the opportunity to um, uh, provide a neutral platform that can facilitate uh, immediate action um, that then will be able to um, not just uh, empower action bottom up, but also make sure that the actions are not tied to political cycles, cycles of individual administrations that, that they can have continuity. So back to you, Cecilia, for any um, other interventions. Yeah, I think we made it on time. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay. Fantastic. Then, um, uh, so um, so um, it, 
I think we're getting, um, so thank you, thank you, Cecilia, for your perspective from the Mexican context. Uh, context. I now want to um, invite uh, Christian. Uh, Christian, um, first of all, I wanted to say congratulations on the newly launched Al Alianza para la Acción Climática de Argentina. So for our audience, um, the, the Argentinian Multi-Stakeholder Alliance was launched yesterday. Um, so this is um, a really a new effort with a lot of excitement um, and, and, and commitment from actors in Argentina. Uh, please, um, uh, Christian, tell us about um, this nascent multi-stakeholder coalition. Uh, why in the Argentinian context you saw this coalition as being critical and what opportunities do you see? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity to, to share I mean, the, all the excitement that we have after, we have to say that after returning from California, from San Francisco, from the Global Climate Action Summit, uh, really learn from the examples from Japan and from the United States and Mexico about how they, they create these alliances. Um, and then we see that as in, in these countries, we have found that there is an emerging leadership in climate action also in Argentina. Uh, let me say that uh, we, CREA, uh, as an organization of, of farmers of the agricultural sectors, we have a history of, of um, environmental, um, I mean, uh, importance for us. We, we started 60 years ago um, because uh, we, our producers found some problems so with the wind erosion of the soils. And since then, we have been uh, growing, and today we are more than 2,000 farmers. In Argentina, and we represent about between five to twenty percent of the agricultural products that are produced in Argentina, and it's very important for us because Argentina is an agricultural country, and we produce uh, food for more than four hundred million people. So it's extremely important to have this commitment. Also, in Argentina this year, uh, we experienced the process of the G20 that uh, next year will happen in, in Japan, and next week we'll have the G20 Summit, finally, in, in Buenos Aires. And we participated in B20 in the task force of the sustainable food system. And let me share two, two learnings from that experience. First was that uh, we need a comprehensive approach if we are talking about sustainability and sustainable food uh, systems. We cannot um, talk only about environment because we cannot only talk about economy. We have to see it in a very comprehensive way in order to have sustainable solutions. And also another learning that we have is that uh, the private sector, we need to take action. We are responsible. We have the responsibility to, uh, to get involved in the solutions. And therefore we see this opportunity in, with this alliance to, to share uh, knowledge and to, in some way, to give more visibility to the actions that our producers can take to improve their resilience and reduce their carbon footprint, and, and also the socioeconomical benefits for producers and society. We have many examples of how we can reduce this footprint from cover crops, that are crops which are not aimed at harvesting, but they provide many ecosystem services and like water dynamic regulation and carbon sequestration. So we see solutions, technological solutions that have win-win um, output from not only from the environmental I mean, carbon footprint uh, aspect, but also from the social economic aspects. It's very important for us. Um, the food sector is about uh, 10%, 12% of the GDP, and we represent about 60% of our exports. So to have these win-win solutions and to maintain this comprehensive approach is essential for us. We have really the hope that sharing with other um, partners from the private sector, from the academy and the subnational governments, we will be able to not only to tackle the issue of climate change through our own actions, but also to provide enough information for the public to create really a cultural change that make 
all of us a more sustainable society. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, and thank you for that, uh, you know, for that perspective. I know that the Alliance is, is uh, in Argentina is going to cover um, different topics, but definitely working on the agriculture uh, sector is absolutely critical, um, you know, for, uh, for the Argentinian economy and society and for Argentina's emissions profile. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's very encouraging to see that as one of the key areas of focus of the new, um, mm -hmm. of the new alliance. Um, so now I wanted to go back to you, Alexa, because as um, you know, the Japanese, the Mexican, and the Argentinian alliances are months or even a day <laughs> old, while we are still in is the eldest brother or sister um, uh, here, um, having been around for over a year now. So, um, so Alexa, we wanted you to tell to tell us and to tell the audience about We Are Still In, about the early impact that We Are Still In has had on climate action in the United States, and what potential role do you see for cities, states, businesses, and so many others in the United States? What role do you see for them to play between now and 2020 to help um, uh, help the United States move towards its NDC and to cl uh, champion climate uh, future climate ambition in the future? Uh, that is in line with 1.5. So, so please tell us about the experience, uh, the very inspiring experience in the U.S. Thanks, Mariana. Um, and first, let me just congratulate all of my colleagues on all of all of their work, um, from our Japanese colleagues uh, to our Mexican colleagues, and and newly uh, Argentina. Congratulations to you, especially for for getting this off the ground. And um, it's very exciting to see this new new momentum um, all around the world. Um, unfortunately, from the the U.S. perspective, uh, our we are still in. Um, Alliance Coalition was really born out of a, a specific moment in time, as you all know, um, when the U.S. president said that he would no longer uh, be involved in Paris. And um, and so we had to, as non-state actors, come out strong and quickly to really counter this this message. Um, for us, it was it was all about the timing to say, no, we actually believe in the Paris Agreement. We believe in the goals of the Paris Agreement, and we support the United States target of 26 to 28 percent reduction uh, below 2005 levels by 2025. And so we will do our part in meeting that goal. Um, we obviously can't do it alone. We we need the, the U.S. federal government to be engaged. And, and we look forward to that moment when uh, they can become re-engaged. But um, at this point, we have, you know, this movement was really about providing comfort and providing um, assurance that there is climate action, ambitious climate action going on um, from cities to states to um, business and private sector, academia, all across the board um, of support for Paris and its goals and for really climate action. Um, so it's amazing how the group has grown. Uh, the impact so far, it started out, you know, with a, a handful of people <laughs> talking about the idea and has now grown to over 3,500 uh, U.S. businesses, investors, states, cities, universities, faith groups, tribes, um, cultural institutions, healthcare organizations, um, and many more that have that have stepped up to say we are still in. Um, so these, these climate leaders today represent more than 154 million Americans across Across 50 states um, and collectively account from almost um, 10 trillion dollars of the US economy so it's pretty it's pretty massive and I think it does uh, really achieve it has achieved that goal of at least sending that political message to the world that um, you know that that the the US on the ground and from the bottom-up level is committed to Paris and meeting its targets um, so you know I think that's that's where we are so far um, it's interesting because there are so many thousands of members, as I mentioned, each of those subgroups uh, are really doing their own initiatives and coordinating in their own areas to work together and to drive uh, you know, action on the ground. You can't do it with 3,000 members. So um, there, as, a, as California, we are working specifically with other states through the U.S. Climate Alliance, so 17 other states, uh, to really work on policies that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions right away. Um, so this is things like vehicle standards, um, collaboration on natural and working lands, on short-lived climate pollutants, um, on carbon neutrality um, with with California's recent new new goal announced at the summit um, 
so I think, you know, there are specific policy areas where we can collaborate and we are collaborating. And that's really, I think the challenge of downscaling and now all of those actors need to, to collaborate and work together, learn from each other, replicate good practice um, and not reinvent the wheel to just do the work of the, the policy and legal work um, that that is needed to to ramp up action on the ground um, I'll just say that uh, looking forward you know you've asked about the impact but but looking forward we've also seen uh, that with increased subnational ambition there's the potential to reduce US emissions by 24 percent below 2005 levels by 2025 so I think it's important to note that you know that doesn't get us all the way to the to the US NDC we know even with all of our collective action it's still not enough um, but we can certainly inch closer to that goal we can and we can, you know, um, make good headway and, uh, and we'll still need the federal government to, to get us all the way there and certainly to, to provide that enhanced ambition that we'll so need um, by 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. Um, that's, um, that's fantastic. Um, so um, I think that we, um, these coalitions, we are, um, they're young efforts, but um, I think the the collective dream is is for these coalitions to start representing, um, you know, and and inspiring increasing segments, um, you know, of of the um, economies and societies in each of the countries where where they work. Um, I think Alexa, you were making uh, you know an important point, and that is. Um, you know, I think the leadership we're seeing around the, this panel is so amazing. It's so inspiring. And behind you, you have all of the actors in your countries that are involved in these coalitions. And, and this is incredibly uplifting. But you made an important point, and that is that as we look to the work ahead, subnational and non-state actors at the national level have a critical role to play. But this is not in lieu of the political leadership and the policy leadership of national governments. It has to be working in tandem. National governments have to help provide that unified direction and commitment and show a political commitment to the transition um, that needs to happen as quickly as possible. And so ultimately what we need is both national governments and some national and non-state actors to work together. So what I wanted was to go back to each one of you and say, what immediate opportunities do you see to work with your national governments? Um, and what opportunities or, you know, and or in the case, in certain cases, more extreme cases, what, what are you doing in the, you know, in the meantime? Um, so I would like to invite, invite you all to, to reflect because ultimately we are trying to uh, show in each of these countries that there is appetite for greater action, but ultimately in order to to move things to a new level, engagement with national governments is critical around the question of accelerating climate action and around the question of greater climate ambition. So maybe starting with you, Mr. Kato, I was wondering what opportunities do you see to work with the national government in Japan? And you alluded to some, uh, uh, you know, um, a, a bit of this at the beginning, but if you can reflect um, on this and then we'll, we'll come back to, um, uh, to the others. Okay, thank you, Marianne. As I may, uh, mentioned before, uh, Japan Climate Initiative looked at the opportunity to make some uh, governmental uh, long-term decarbonized strategy. And, and uh, I'd like to express an ambitious decarbonization strategy can create the space for the conversation opportunities to accept decarbonization or climate actions in the short term and in the long term. In other words, an uh, ambitious uh, decarbonization strategy help uh, companies and the local governments uh, for long-term planning and long-term investment, and more than that, also the short-term decision-making with comfort, the comfort. So we work together with the national government for that purpose. Yeah, that's very helpful, Mr. Kato. Um, uh, Christian, um, you know, what opportunities do you see, immediate opportunities do you see um, with the government of Argentina, for example? How would you um, reflect on this question of working with the national government? Yes, thank you, Mariana. Uh, we see really a tremendous potential to work with the national government. Um, we have to say that 
and agricultural sector and land use change uh, it covers about 48 percent of the emissions in Argentina and we say that then we represent the sector that has about 48 percent of the solution in Argentina but uh, regardless the this huge uh, fraction of the of the emissions the original NDCs of Argentina included adaptation actions for the agricultural and land sectors, but included little when it came to, to mitigation actions in these sectors. And we see tremendous potential in this area in order to propose different technologies and things that we know that the farmers are doing that reduce a lot the emissions. So we see a tremendous opportunity to work um, together with the government, with the national government to to discuss these NDCs, and we say that it, we can jointly identify areas where subnational and non-state actors want to lead. We can help the, the government of Argentina to reflect these opportunities more accurately in, in our uh, national contributions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Christian. Um, Cecilia, would you like to reflect on these questions? What opportunities do you see to work with the national government of Mexico? Sí, gracias. Primero, bueno, las limitantes a las que se enfrentan los gobiernos subnacionales, pues logran, son bastantes, o sea, si bien son responsables en gran parte de la implementación de las acciones climáticas, pues su éxito depende no únicamente de sus políticas y acciones, sino también de sus capacidades técnicas y su acceso a financiamiento. Entonces, un vínculo de colaboración con el gobierno nacional, pues tiene que ser ese flujo constante eh, de acceso a financiamiento, por ejemplo. También, pues cada nivel de gobierno tiene su propia jurisdicción en ciertos sectores, eh, por ejemplo, los inventarios de, de gases de efecto invernadero para el resto de Jalisco y para México, pues los niveles más altos siempre son eh, como, como emisores, pues son el sector de transporte y, y el de energía. En el caso de Jalisco, pues al concentrar el 80% de su población en un área metropolitana, pues tiene un gran reto en cuanto al transporte y energía, ¿no? Entonces, imaginar una movilidad más sustentable y menos dependiente de combustibles fósiles, creo que puede ser una estrategia de pilotaje que esta iniciativa pueda detonar, construyendo así este, sus medidas de mitigación contenidas en los NDC. Great, great. So Cecilia, Cecilia's point was that, um, uh, you know, the NDC in Mexico was built with the assumption that, um, you know, there will be that that the local levels, the municipal and the state levels are going to be critical engines for delivery. And there needs to be much more uh, a closer coordination for that to happen, um, you know, effectively. And there are areas in which the national government of Mexico can help accelerate the process, for example, by articulating with um, subnational and non-state actors um, through the provision of finance. That can definitely make a big difference in terms of accelerating climate action. So, um, so that is uh, one area in which these kind of bottom-up effort of multi-stakeholders coalitions can make a difference. The other thing that she highlighted is that there are also opportunities to work at the sectoral level. So she was bringing in the example of the metropolitan area of Guadalajara, which, um, you know, um, uh, in many in many uh, uh, metropolitan areas, and Guadalajara is a perfect example of that. The issue of transport is critical. If you're going to reduce the emissions um, of um, those uh, more local jurisdictions, transport is a critical area um, that will be important um, for those uh, for those areas, and will ultimately be important for the delivery um, and the achievement of the Mexican NDC. So there are opportunities, uh, you know, there to coordinate efforts uh, that make sense at the local level but also deliver on national goals um, so uh, maybe Alexa back to you in terms of any any reflections on that question we know the, the challenging circumstances um, you know in the United States but any thoughts you wanted to um, bring in terms of opportunities to work with national governments from your perspective and we are still in but maybe also from your bigger perspective um, you know from California um, you know having hosted the you know the summit and having thought about um, you know, basically the summit being such an important piece to inspire national governments to do more. Sure, yeah, I think, um, so as I mentioned, unfortunately we have a, a national government that has made it clear um, that they don't really believe in the science behind climate change. Um, 
and are not interested in, you know, still being part of, of the Paris Agreement, um, which we hold so dear. So uh, from the California perspective, I think we're in an, an interesting place. Um, it has a lot more to do with kind of holding the line of what we are doing and our ambitious policies um, and sharing with those other, you know, states and subnational actors who share those views and really making sure that we don't uh, backslide. You know, we, we hear that term a lot in the context of the Paris Agreement, and I think that really applies uh, to the situation that we find ourselves in in the United States. Um, as some national actors who are ambitious on climate change, we want to, you know, make sure that we don't go backwards. Um, and in fact, that we do make progress in meeting uh, the, the U.S.'s NDC that's currently on the table. So with that said, uh, California is doing a lot. Our, our um, attorney general has been very active in a lot of the, the efforts um, that this administration um, nationally has made to, to, to roll back policies that do reduce greenhouse gases. Um, earlier this year, um, our attorney general joined 27 others from other states um, calling on this national administration to give the American people a fair chance to make their, their voices heard um, on the effort to, to roll back the Clean Power Plan, um, which is a, a huge kind of keystone piece to, to meet the, the US NDC. Um, so being very vocal on that and coordinating with other, with other states. Um, we've also earlier this year coordinated with 17 other states um, to, to sue uh, the, the US EPA to, to in fact preserve our uniform uh, vehicle emission standards. Um, we think that those standards are critical for saving drivers money at the pump, um, cutting oil consumption and reducing air pollution, uh, and of course, reducing greenhouse gases. So we are stand ready to, to protect those emission standards and working with other states to do that. Um, and then also this year, um, our, uh, our governor, um, Jerry Brown, as well as the Attorney General of California, um, and then our Air Resources Board um, led a coalition of 21 other attorneys general um, to file formal comments demanding that the EPA and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration withdraw uh, their proposal to eliminate our clean car standards. So we are doing all that we can. Um, we are happy to work with, with the federal government um, whenever our, our goals and our aspirations on climate change align. And uh, when, when that doesn't happen, then we stand very ready and prepared uh, to defend our positions and to keep our ambitious policies in place and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. So um, as the audience can see, there are tremendous opportunities for leadership that are actually being taken by uh, by um, these coalitions and the and the members um, that are part of them, um, you know, to really um, move forward on climate action, engage their national governments where possible, and really live up to uh, the goals of the of the Paris Agreement, which is tremendously inspiring. This alliance of front runners um, that CBF is calling for, um, you know, has allies um, all over the world. Um, close to, um, you know, the ground, um, you know, uh, leading by example. Um, we now have um, uh, questions from the audience coming in, and it's fantastic to see, um, you know, people following from around the world, following um, our session uh, live. And thanks again to CBF for this um, uh, global carbon-free uh, summit that is allowing us to be in conversations with uh, um, everyone, everybody around the world. And the question that has come through is, um, it's 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 interesting. It's a question around communication, and I think you know each of these coalitions is trying to ground you know to be really relevant to their national context. But there are some challenges and opportunities that are common across these coalitions. And the question um, that is being posed by um, one of our listeners is. How do you see, what do you think will allow these uh, coalitions to communicate effectively um, on the issue of climate change so that we can engage um, the audience, so that we can engage the public in our countries and the world about uh, not only the risks 
um, and the vulnerability that climate change poses, but also the possibilities, um, the possibilities that putting, um, you know, developing um, uh, based on a, a, you know, low carbon, uh, basically with low emissions, with a low carbon footprint, um, what possibilities does this create? So what is your experience as, to, as you balance this question of communicating based on risks and communicating based on possibilities? What do you find will be um, effective in your in your countries? And here I'm open it up to whoever wants to take a first pass at that great question. Any takers? Um, so should these people about? communicate possibilities? <laughs> should they communicate risks? What do you think? Yes, somebody was coming in. Okay, puedo empezar? Um, sí, vamos Cecilia. Okay, gracias. <laughs> um, creo que una comunicación efectiva de, debe involucrar la participación ciudadana Eh, claro, el mensaje debe de empoderar, debe hacerle sentir a la ciudadanía que sus acciones o no acciones pues suman o restan a la acción climática. Eh, hacer sentir a la sociedad que son actores claves y que el, y que el reto global de cambio climático es un, es un reto que no respeta eh, fronteras, género, generaciones, eh, que, es un, que es un tema eh, que es responsable de todos y que es un tema que no es responsable de un único actor, que, que el sector gobierno, las industrias, no son, no son los únicos responsables, que todos somos responsables eh, día a día de nuestras decisiones y que esas suman eh, o restan a la acción climática. Thank you, Cecilia. So, so Cecilia was emphasizing this importance of uh, coalitions really reaching out to the broader citizen, citizenry. So the importance of engaging the public and being able to frame um, the issue of climate action as a, uh, as a shared responsibility and as a shared opportunity with the understanding that we each have a part to play, but that climate change is also something that goes uh, basically beyond national mm -hmm. front. Here. So, so the the sense of um, I would here I'm putting my own words, but just to 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 uh, mm -hmm. expand on what Cecilia said, this sense of um, uh, global destiny um, in the sense that we are all um, you know involved in this, but also this um, the sense of um, individual um, you know responsibility that we each have to play. Um, so, any other thoughts on the question of um, Emphasizing possibilities versus risks. Christian, come, please come in. Yes, uh, as a farmer myself, I have to say that, uh, I mean, sadly, we are suffering a lot of the effects of and the impacts of climate change. So, I mean, I think we really have to work out the, the connection between what uh, the, the climate, what is, and the weather, what is happening with, with us and with the rain today, that we, we are having really problems with our crops and our sector because of this climate crisis and we have to connect this uh, climate crisis with, with with our actions with everyday actions and and think and i think i am convinced that the the private sector those we are emitting uh, we have a huge responsibility to acknowledge these uh, problems that we are creating and but also emphasizing that we are part of the solution and not only of the problem so we have I, I think we have to work very much on this connection thank you thank you Christian um, okay so oh yes Alexa please come on in and I'll just say quickly from the, the California perspective, um, we found it very helpful to to talk about uh, how our um, greenhouse gas emissions have gone down over you know the last eight. Um, we've actually California has met our 2020 target um, already four years early, um, and we've done that all while increasing our GDP, so growing our economy and um, and creating new jobs. We find that that's really what speaks to to the to the common man, um, you know, who don't don't want to hear about all these policies and and the IPCC report. Um, they want to hear about the economy growing and they want to hear about new jobs. Um, so in California, we've created over 3 million new jobs since 2010, um, and employment has declined more than 65% to a low of about 4%. And again, that's all while we've been implementing these ambitious policies and um, meeting our greenhouse gas 2020 target early. So um, I think that that's a really important success story for us, and um, that's what we try to share with, with, with the world when we, when we talk about the importance of action on climate change. Fantastic. 
Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. So, um, so I think we're getting to uh, close to the end of our time, and um, you know, the I wanted to go back to this to this question that the summit um, is is um, aiming to to create. Uh, this broader momentum of uh, leaders from around the world really championing climate action and calling for greater ambition um, so that we can he keep 1.5 within reach. The coalitions that you represent are doing just that in each of your countries. You're aiming to lead by example and bring others and inspire others to, to, to do their part. So the world is listening to you, um, the four of you today. And so as we close, I was wondering what last thoughts would you like, uh, would you like to share um, to inform the, the conversation that will take place um, in the next um, day plus um, as part of CBF, but also that will um, trickle and hopefully inform the conversations that will take place in COP24 and beyond. So closing remarks. And we'll have three minutes um, for all of us. So, um, so I invite your uh, closing remarks um, uh, succinctly. So, Who would like to come? Can I can I start first? Yes, please, Mister. So, as a founder of the Japan Climate Initiative uh, across non-state actors uh, coalition, uh, I'd like to close with our CEO J.K. Amashita's keynote speech at the Climate Week in New York this September. He said that, as saying goes, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. Borrow it from our children. If we all truly unite, we can achieve great things and our people will be promising for generations to come. So some national and non-state actors and national government, all of us, let's work together and collaborate together for our children. That is our CEO's message to all of you. So I hope that good success on also COP24 this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kato. Um, let's see, Cecilia, do you want to come next with... Uh a brief intervention. Ya, yeah. sí, gracias. Eh, para cerrar y como para resumir todo, eh, a mí me gustaría ver eh, pues esta esta alianza. Me gustaría bien que los esfuerzos locales se vean reflejados en los NDC que México ha adoptado. Eh, reitero, pues me gustaría que no fuera un tema eh, sectorizado, que se logre ver como un tema eh, transversal, primordial en la agenda. Eh, que incluye una participación ciudadana y, por último, un acompañamiento más de cerca del gobierno nacional. Thank you. So Cecilia calls on mainstreaming climate change, um, look at across sectors, involve citizenship and work closely with the government. That's what she wants, you know, bringing the message of the Alliance from Mexico. Cristian, you're next. Yeah, thank you. Well, addressing climate change is a, is a really shared responsibility. We call on the private sector to take responsibility and lead this individually and through collaboration with others. Um, I think this, we are convinced that this is a great business for all of us. So we need to get involved and try to, to collaborate to, to work out these solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alexa, last words. Sure, I'll quickly just say that um, the UN FCCC released uh, yesterday two publications um, that highlight that success in tackling the, the climate change crisis can be achieved only if public and private sector actions are, are uh, urgently stepped up. So sub-national actors, non-state non actors are part of the solution and a big part. Um, so I would just encourage us all to be like the Marshall Islands, um, which as at the opening of the summit said that they will enhance uh, their NDC. They put a new NDC on the table um, in anticipation of the 2020 moment. And let's look to them for leadership and inspiration to be more ambitious. Um, come to 2019 to the Secretary General Summit it with more ambition on the table and um, let's turn the tides in 2020. So I think Alexa had the, um, the last word um, and said it so powerfully. Thank you everybody for joining us and, um, and really join us. Join us in this um, and in creating this global 
alliance of front runners so that we can uh, enact this uh, transition to create prosperity based on low carbon development and uh, climate resilient around the world. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. 